Zia Scaraval from ZK Research here, and I'm back at the Worldwide Technologies booth inside the world of solutions at Cisco Live 2023 here in Las Vegas. And uh, we're going to be talking data center and cloud and compute and all that great stuff. And uh, I've got three, uh, three experts here. I've got, uh, first of all, Allison Dollar. you're from Intel. Correct. Uh, tell me a little bit of what you do and what your role is there. Yeah, so I'm at Intel. I've been at Intel for 17 years, and I'm the global account director for Cisco um, in the sales and marketing organization. All right, and then uh, Jeremy Foster, you're from Cisco. Yeah, Jeremy Foster from Cisco. I'm the general manager of the compute business. And uh, Dave Alexander, I think you play on both sides of this coin, right? You work with both companies. You're from Worldwide Technology. What's your role there? Absolutely, so uh, Dave Alexander, WWT. I've been here about uh, 10 years, uh, and I manage the uh, data center infrastructure team uh, for our global solutions and architecture group. All right, now we are at Cisco Live, right? And it's a uh, uh, big, you know, a big event, uh, lots of key themes here. I know cloud and, and data center has been a big theme at this event for years. Uh, it's interesting that, um, you know, over the last decade or so, there's been a lot of rhetoric in the industry that everything's moving to the cloud. Uh, that never really turns out to be that way whenever, you know, whenever people predict that. Uh, in fact, somebody asked me the other day, do I envision a year where everything's in the cloud? I thought, you know, if maybe, but I'll be dead, so who knows, right? But, but I'm curious from your perspective, Allison, what, what you're seeing there. What are some of the trends in data center? Today? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah. We're actually seeing growth at both ends of the spectrum. And I'll, I'll quote a recent, actually, Cisco survey um, where we're seeing 82% of enterprises are saying they're operating in a hybrid environment. 58% are actively moving workloads between on-prem and off-prem weekly. And as you both weekly. know, weekly. Yeah. So as you both know, this creates tremendous complexity with the infrastructure and requires leaps in terms of performance, scalability, reliability, and security. And enterprises are getting more intelligent and they're really thinking about workload placement very differently. And it's now it's turned into the right workload in the right place to solve the right problem. The decision making is getting that intricate. So it's no longer a one size fits all strategy. Everything's not rushing to one side as we might have thought was happening a few years ago. We're definitely seeing a balance in a hybrid world. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because what might be the right location for that workload at that right time might not be tomorrow. Right, yeah, and that's, that's interesting because it, it does require a lot more agility at that compute layer. So Dave, you, uh, uh, you, know, you work with com customers as they migrate things to the cloud and back, and uh, why are they doing that and what are some of the barriers uh, to, to make that actually doable? Yeah, great question, and, and to, to Allison's point, uh, one of the biggest challenges is really in deciding where the right place is for that workload, and again, to your point, that may not be the same. Uh, uh, from day to day, and so uh, that's that's one of the barriers. Really, is finding uh, the the right place, but also then the movement of data back and forth, uh, and the complexities of securing that data and securing the transport of that data as it moves uh, with and without uh, the the uh, control of of your uh, sovereign data center. Okay, and Jeremy, you're uh, just one thing I would add to that. I mean, I think spot on, it's also the cost elements of things, right? I mean, IT is an optimization game. We continue to optimize further and further. So now that we've settled on, we're going to live in this hybrid cloud world, I think what I see a lot with customers is they're just trying to figure out how to optimize both the technology side of it, but also the financial needs that they need to be able to meet because a lot of our customers aren't seeing their budgets triple just because they're in a hybrid cloud world, right? They have to be able to do more with less. Yeah, and uh, the interesting thing about cloud is I think Inherently, a lot of people think cloud's cheaper, uh, and it probably is for some workloads, but not all workloads, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. that it's a, it's a workload by workload, case by case kind of, your application is this thing that's spread across potentially areas in the cloud, on-prem, right? Your data's, it, where's the data reside? There's no two applications at scale that are going to be exactly alike. So figuring out the right ways to, to optimize workload placement, like Allison was saying, is really important. Yeah, and it is all workload based. You know, the analogy I've used with people is if you, if I were to ask you, is a pickup truck or a Toyota Prius more fuel efficient? Most people would say the Toyota Prius, but what if I said you had to haul 5,000 pounds of gravel across the country, right? Then you do it in one take with the truck. So unless you understand the workload, it's hard to actually make that cost advantage. Yeah. Now, um, Jeremy, you've been, uh, Cisco's been in compute for, oh, decades now, right? You've, 14 years. Yeah, you've had a, a market leading portfolio with UCS. I know you've, you've uh, changed the architecture of it uh, lately and you've had a new line release. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, the overall UCS architecture is 
very similar in terms of there's not a rip and replace new brand new architecture. However, we did release uh, UCSX, which UCSX is the first new blade chassis, new hardware chassis that we've released since 2009, which is a big deal simply for a couple of reasons. One is no one in the space has ever had a chassis ever lived for over a decade and be able to deliver advancements that happen as Intel builds better processors and we put more and more memory and work more and more, you know, uh, output from these systems over that long of a period of time. And so customers are super excited about UCSX. Um, they're, they're really happy with the fact that we have this new architecture that can live for another 10 years, but fit into that same operational framework that they've been enjoying since 2009. And that's, that's, that's where we've been at. Yeah, and that's, uh, I think that plays nicely into some of the trends I've been seeing too, where customers are thinking, um, as, you know, as they manage their infrastructure, they're thinking more platform versus uh, kind of just swapping out equipment for swapping out equipment, right? And so that lets them make better decisions. And the hardware piece is just to start, right? Like it really comes back to how are we managing that portfolio? And one of the big changes is Intersight, which is being able to manage from a SaaS-based platform that lives out in the cloud, whether you're in one data center, two data centers, across five data centers, 500 locations, and across really the hybrid cloud, right? Like, do you want, can you have visibility to what's happening with some virtual machines in AWS all from that same console, so you can make those migrations and, and those operations on day two easier? That's been a big focus of what we've done with the overall UCS portfolio. Okay, and Allison, um, you know, Intel has had a, uh, pretty long-standing relationship with Cisco, but you have a relationship with obviously all the server manufacturers. Uh, how's that relationship with Cisco, and how do you two work together to help customers solve those problems? Yeah, I mean, so with Cisco, we've, we've been partnering together for, we have a long, rich history. I think spanning at least like three decades at this point, yeah. dating back to the 90s, we've done well, yeah, Wi-Fi yeah. standards, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Like, so from the beginning. Um, and we've worked together across a number of major technology shifts, most recently like 5G, IoT, edge computing, data center modernization. But specifically with compute, we've been together since day one. Since 2009, Intel was proud to be a partner with Cisco to help bring UCS to the market, a product that really transformed the server platform. Yeah. And today, we raised the bar even more. So with Intel's fourth generation Xeon platform, combined with UCS seventh gen, uh, C-Series and X-Series, it's really delivering greater flexibility, more performance to customers, and it's just an amazing platform, and we've just been, you know, we, we highly value the relationship we have with Cisco at Intel. Yeah, in fact, I remember that launch uh, when Cisco got into servers, there was a lot of eyebrows raised. Why would Cisco go into the server market? But uh, you kind of really changed the way people thought about servers, I think, and uh, almost came out of nowhere and took you know, a big chunk of that market. So. Yeah, I mean, it's really been all about not just delivering a server, but delivering a system, integrating compute in with the fabric, removing the number of components that you normally would need to be able to, to use, and then ultimately get ahead of, how, if you don't have as many components, you can pull out costs, and certainly we can pull out the things that you have to operate on day two. And, you know, Intel's been a part of it with us uh, every step of the way. And Dave, you work with both these companies. Absolutely. Greg, you've got strategic relationships. In fact, if I, um, you know, go to your offices, I think these are two of the, <laughs> to the logos I always see there. So how are, you know, how is this relationship helping you help solve your customers' problems? Well, yeah, so the, the, the strategic relationships that we have with both Intel and Cisco, they've been uh, very, very valuable to us in, in able, being able to bring you know, these, these kinds of solutions, uh, not just compute, as you pointed out, but a, but a whole solution, a whole system. And then with Intel, not just just a processor, and I know that's what most people know Intel for, but not just a processor, but also into the networking space, into the accelerator space, uh, into the open software frameworks that a lot of our customers are starting to use uh, in order to, to uh, get better performance uh, and better predictability from their applications. Yeah, I think the important thing to understand too is, you know, I, I see all the stuff written about this, everything's in software now, but there are some things that are best optimized in software, some best optimized in hardware and some in silicon, right? And I think it's the ability to understand what those are and then create something that optimizes for all those different use cases, right? So. And, and also to not, to not have to refactor an application every time yeah. you want to introduce an accelerator. Those, those kinds of frameworks are very, very important. Yeah, so let's talk edge computing, right? Because I know that's been a big use case. Uh, first of all, why don't you start with you, Dave? Define edge, right? I, I was having dinner with a CIO friend of mine and he goes, edge confuses me because every time I talk to somebody, they've got a different definition of what it is, so what is edge? 
Well, and actually that's a great question. And I don't know that it's one that I can answer either. So the, the challenge with, with Edge, like terms like cloud and Edge, is it can vary depending on the application. It can vary depending on the needs of, of uh, any particular customer or, or market. So uh, in very broad terms, it typically means putting uh, some type of processing compute closer to where either decisions are being made, data is being produced or collected, and then being able to make real-time decisions based on uh, what you're collecting. Uh, being able to, say, collect sensor data in a warehouse and be able to make a decision about how that warehouse is operating uh, without having to wait for that data to be uploaded to a central data center, be processed, some decision made, and then pushed back. So, Edge can really mean something different depending on uh, on the application and, and, and where it lives, but generally it means pushing out towards uh, or further away from the uh, the data center. Yeah, are you seeing customers asking about that now? Oh yeah, I mean, it, to your point, it's such a broad spectrum of things that falls in there. You know, retail customers have been worried about edge compute for a really long time, right? And so that's still an edge use case. So breaking it into these vertical segments, whether you're looking at manufacturing, and those needs are a lot different than what a retail customer would need, is a lot different than what a customer who has a really high end use case and is trying to do something like inference at the edge and get you know high performance data center like compute almost out to the edge near near the, where the data is being collected. Yeah, and what's interesting, I think, about edge is um, the, the compute requirements at the edge aren't a whole lot different than they are in a data center. You just have less of it. Well, it just really, there's a huge, I mean, they are different in that you may have big requirements and you may have really small requirements, like smaller than what a normal data center server network, requirement might be. Correct, you, the same, all the, yeah. the categories are all there for sure. And so how does Intel help? That, that means the way you think about processor stuff, you need different you need to think about it differently at the edge, right? Because Absolutely. you're not, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you defined it similarly the way we do at Intel, right? It's the ability to process, store, move, analyze data closer to where the data is being generated. And you're right, the portfolio at Intel is very broad that we are using to really attack this space. You know, general purpose uh, CPUs, optimized CPUs for AI or for network, yeah. accelerators, networking products, right? It's a, it's a, it's a broad span of portfolio products that really are needed to address this space. Well, let's stay on the AI theme, sure. right? And uh, I do know that that's one of the, um, let's say, it, it bespoke type of use cases, right? Because it is, uh, you know, accelerated computing is quite different than traditional computing. But I know recently you guys have uh, um, uh, uh, evolved your, your, your Flex GPU, right? So talk about what you're doing there. And in fact, edge inferencing is one one of the major use cases for it Edge, is, right? so, it is, yeah. and and thank you, Dave, for saying you know people always think Intel and processors, but there's so much more. Yeah. The portfolio is so broad, and we're so excited to have the Intel Flex GPU family in the market, and it's used for a wide variety of use cases, very intensive use cases, um, media streaming, cloud gaming, AI visual inference, as you said, um, and VDI, just just to name a few. And it's also based on open standards, and it's making it the industry's most open GPU for today's in visual cloud. And from a performance perspective, we're seeing 5X media transcode throughput improvement versus competition at half the power, and a 2X improvement in decode throughput at half the power versus competition. So with the open standards, the TCO benefits, um, as well as the performance, we think it's a product that is well positioned for these intensive um, AI-like workloads that are being demanded today. Okay, and that is, uh, the power part has a big sustainability Huge. impact, right? Yeah, in fact, I just walked by the sustainability zone here, and so I know that's a big focus for Cisco, right? It's yeah. helping, helping customers design sustainability into the architecture. Yeah, it, it, in that sustainability zone, you have the UCSX right there, which are the most sustainable servers in the market today. Um, you know, we recently just won a SEAL award for that. We're super proud of that. But Congratulations. Yeah, it, it, it came down to designing that into the system you know, from day one. You know, it's not about having one cooling zone. It's about having 20 cooling zones, tons of temperature sensors, and figuring out how to, in real time, cool that system to make it more efficient than you know, how we would have done it previously or, or anybody else yeah, in the industry. Yeah, I actually think Cisco's point. done a very good job of that across the entire portfolio. Even on the networking side, there's features like energy wise and things that actually can help customers realize the vision around sustainability yeah. because it's... And that's another new thing that we're bringing out here too. You can't see it in a demo right here, but bringing those capabilities into Intersight so customers can be able to track over time how are they doing it, reducing their power footprint 
and understanding how to take those metrics and expose them to not only their operational teams, but again, how do you take advantage of those capabilities that Intel's putting in the processor so that we can uh, expose those through the software to make it super easy to operationalize. To me, that data point is a, the, the data you have there fills a big gap. I saw a data point uh, about a month ago where it said 90% of businesses now have sustainability goals, but only 10% can actually measure their progress towards it because they don't have the data. So that sounds like you're giving them data. Yeah. So now I want to, uh, one last question for you. The, it's hard to talk to worldwide without talking about the ATC, of right? And uh, so talk about the ATC and how um, customers can use that to actually try some of the stuff that Cisco and Intel are rolling out without having to commit a, you know, a significant amount of money up front or go through the process of the months and months of tuning and tweaking and it can actually hit the ground running. Sure, so yeah, the, the ATC, the Advanced Technology Center that, that we have on our technology campus uh, at our headquarters, uh, it's really a pretty amazing thing. Uh, You'll hear it referred to as a lab sometimes, and I, I don't think that, it's more than that. Though. I don't think that really does it justice. I, I think that the biggest thing that the ATC does for our customers and for our partners uh, is it lets us kind of de-risk that technology evaluation phase. Uh, you know, bringing a, a new technology into a data center. Uh, is inherently risky because of all of the integrations that have to happen between that technology. It's the ultimate, if it ain't broke, don't fix it area, right? Right, yeah. so uh, you know, there, there's all of, the, all of these opportunities for, uh, for a new technology to disrupt what you're doing within the data center. So what the ATC does is it provides you an environment uh, where you can test those integrations, you can test the way that that technology is going to work, uh, not only with what you have today, but with what you're planning on putting in tomorrow, and do that in a risk-free and predictable environment. So it's a, it's a very, very powerful platform. I mean, look, I can't say good enough things about the ATC. I actually happen to live in St. Louis, so I've been around for a long time to see it actually grow from the very beginning. And the one thing I think that's consistent is it's not a lab. There's a lot of technology. There's a lot of technology choice. But to me, it's all about the people that run these systems and, and, and build the practice around it because it's kind of like going to a surgeon. Like, I don't want to go to somebody who's only tried to deploy that, that surgery one time. I want to go to the experts who have done it 500 times and seen way more things from an experience perspective than pretty much anybody else. And so I think that's why customers love walking away from the ATC and that experience. Yeah, it's, it's been a worthwhile investment year after year. I mean, it gives customers an immersive experience whether they're virtual, whether they're in person, and it's a treasure trove for learning. So all the things you said, we, we absolutely back that up at Intel and have been very proud to partner with both of you to populate the ATC with leading technologies. And, and we appreciate the partnership. Yeah, yeah. And as, as you said, it's not just, just because you're not in St. Louis doesn't mean you can't have access to the ATC, oh, correct? Yeah. Yeah, the ATC gives, uh, gives our customers the ability to access that, that equipment uh, from anywhere in the world, 24-7. Uh, whether that is our on-demand type capabilities where you can you can log in and get get access to those at any time or whether it's something bespoke uh, that we that we create specifically for that customer and, the, and their use case. You just go to www.com, create an account and uh, it, contact us and we'll be happy to uh, to get you set up. All right. Well, there you go. I think uh, here we are at Cisco Live. Clouds uh, uh, and data centers are obviously a big topic, so we got to hear from, uh, from, uh, from uh, worldwide Cisco and Intel on behalf of Allison uh, Jeremy and Dave, I'm Zias Caravallo from ZK Research saying thanks for watching.